we paid a thousand dollars and i think that is what took us from let's say two hundred dollars a day to four hundred dollars a day every day Hey, my name is Felix Tia. I'm the host of Shopify Mass with a weekly podcast powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. Each week, we invite entrepreneurs like you to share what they've learned growing successful e-commerce businesses. In this episode, you'll learn how to find an Instagram influencer to be your brand ambassador, how to reuse your content on different platforms, and how a brand can create their own YouTube channel and content. Today, I'm joined by Steve Greer from Rejuvenator. Rejuvenator makes premium shoe care products for stylist individuals who like to wear their shoes with confidence. They were started in 2011 and based out of Phoenix, Arizona, with annual revenues over $5 million. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. So you mentioned to me that you noticed an opportunity in the market and then decided that you had a process for cleaning shoes that was better than what was already out there. Tell us more about this. How did you notice the opportunity? Just being into sneakers my whole life, not growing up with ton of money I always had to take care of them so I had a process where I put them in a pillowcase wash them in the washing machine you know pre-treated them prior to that and then let them go in the washing machine and after the washing machine the knot to untie to get them out it took like 10 minutes to get the knot out so one night I was just doing it and kind of thought to myself how come there isn't an easier way or a product out there that I could do this same process and it'd be just more effective and easier so I started doing research and really that's how it all started so you didn't see anything out in the marketplace you didn't see any competition that was already doing something that might have met your needs correct there was other shoe cleaners on the market but it was just like a simple brush and cleaning solution which works great for certain shoes, but other shoes that need a deep clean, like mesh and other materials, you really can't get that clean with just a Russian solution. So I felt that there was other people that would be interested in it. Right, got it. So once you had this idea, you were talking about how you had the idea essentially a year before you officially started. So what were you doing between the time you had this inkling of an idea and the time you actually launched? I mean, I don't know how detailed you want to get, but I I had recently gotten into some trouble. So I basically was thinking of ways that I could support myself and kind of change my life around and starting a business. I've always been somewhat of an entrepreneur. Um, Some of the time it maybe wasn't that legal, but that's really kind of what, where I was at that point. I just gotten in some trouble and I was thinking, hey, what can I do to support myself and better my life. Um, And that was just one of the ideas that I had that I stuck with and, you know, saw some opportunity. Yeah, I think that makes sense. You're looking for a way to support yourself and a lot of people turn into starting a business, but it still takes a while, right? To start bringing in that cash flow. How long did it take before you were feeling like you're able to support yourself with the business? (laughs) I mean, that was years. It was probably two years before I before we saw traction. Obviously, I started it pretty much all by myself. And from everything, I mean, I did every job, stringing the bags to filling the bottles, with labeling the bottles. I mean, you name it, I've done it. I had to learn graphic design. I assumed that I could just have a website built and then put it online and then people would start buying. It doesn't really work like that. So it took a couple of years to really get get going. Once I, once I brought somebody on that was really into the sneaker world uh, more than in, in more depth than me, and we really started using Instagram and social media, that's when we started seeing some traction. And we were in the early days, you know, 2012. Instagram when before really a lot of people were doing it. So it sounded like you were in pretty de- kind of desperate situation, but took a couple of years before you were able to support yourself. And you said that one of the reasons why you were able to create this successful business is because you didn't give up when it got tough. During those two years, I'm sure it got very tough and you still continue to work on it. Can you give examples of times that were tough during those two years and maybe what brought you close to quitting and how you overcame that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if there's no traction and, and it's, it feels like whatever you do isn't working and you don't know, you feel overwhelmed. Because, again, I've never, I had never done it before. Um, this was something completely new for me. 
so no experience. Just knowing that the product was like by far the most effective on the market. <clears throat> Everyone that I gave it to or bought it really, really liked it and you know said that I had something there. Um, I actually also got a call back from by Shark Tank in the earlier stages, but since I had a felony on my record, they will not put you on the show. So that was like a high and a low, you know, all within that first two years. So those those are the kind of things that really kept me going. I would say it's just the belief and knowing that if I kept going, I would figure it out. Right. So you saw traction, you saw validation. What gave you the confidence to know that even though you didn't know the answers today, that you would eventually figure it out? What made you sure of that? The belief that in myself that I can do whatever I set my mind to, really. It just depends on how bad you want it. I mean, you, you really almost have to obsess. You have to obsess about it. I mean, if you think about it for six hours out of the day, it's in the early stages, it's never going to work. I mean, I'm talking 12, 15-hour days every day, just always thinking about what I can do to, to make this thing work. That's what it took for me anyways. Right. So you mentioned that things really took off when you brought someone on that was deeper into the sneaker world that was helping you with the social media side. Can you say more about this? How did you find someone to help you out? Yes. So, you know, I've had a few people lend a hand throughout the process, which has been great because it's really tough to do on your own. Um, And so I just kept running into a buddy of mine that I've known from, you know, years past. Our girlfriends uh, were friends, so we had met and I knew he was really into sneakers, so I pitched him an idea. I said, hey, man, I got this thing. I'm, I, I need some help to get this off the ground. And he's like, yeah, let me think about it. And basically came back, you know, four or five days and said, hey, dude, let's, yeah, I've been thinking about that. I was in Vegas. Let's see what we can do. So we just really started spending a bunch of time together, just coming up with ideas. And Instagram is really what what helped us gain some traction. As soon as we started, I mean, we were on Instagram before you could put videos. So we were like the first, one of the first businesses probably to start using a lot. So you guys are focusing on Instagram. Tell us more about the strategy here. Was the platform that really took things to the next level for you? It it was. And, And because there's certain, in the early days of Instagram, they would have these dollar pages where a lot of sneakerheads and shoe enthusiasts, you could go sell your shoes on somebody's page, right? You, you just pay them a dollar or two for the post, and you could you could basically sell the shoes that you had, and then you could get PayPal, and you would ship the shoes. So we would create ads for those pages and get it in front of a bunch of people, and then just grow our own grow our, our own audience, obviously. So. I mean, I would say within the first year, we had probably had 50,000 subscribers, or followers on, on Instagram. What year was this? When did you start doing this? This is late 2012, 13. Got it. So you're looking for profiles that had your potential customers on there. Correct. And you're buying ads to show your product on those pages. Correct. Yeah. How did you identify it? Like those profiles, how did you know it was a good fit for your product? Just by the sneakers that were on there and the shoes and the activity. I mean, you know if it's your target audience or not. I think that's that's helpful too, is having a target audience, a niche market almost. It's, it's just easier to target than mass market because it's, it's just easier to, to pinpoint those people. Have you bought ads from a page that you maybe didn't think would be successful as it ended up being? We've made purchases on pages that didn't work, and we made purchases for pages that did work. Can you give examples? Looking back, what did you notice about it now that maybe you didn't see at the time, starting with the pages that maybe you didn't expect to work as well as it did? Well, the first big expense that we, like the, the, the biggest dollar amount that we spent on Instagram at that point, we spent $1,000 for one post. And we were kind of just going for it. You know, we, it's not like we had a bunch of money in the bank. So we, we were kind of just going for it. It was, a, it was our target, target audience. It was a page that had, you know, 1.5 million followers or something. And we paid $1,000. And I think 
that is what took us from, let's say, $200 a day to $400 a day every day. You, you hit these little milestones, and then as long as you stay consistent with everything you're doing, you should stay at that sales volume, right? So once we did that, we gained a bunch of followers, and our sales increased on a daily basis. And then there's some that you post and nothing happens at all. So you, you kind of be, you have to be strategic with what you're doing and thoughtful and to not waste money too. I mean, one of the reasons that we became successful, I think, is because I was very careful with where I spent money. Got it. So you spent $1,000 or one post and this turned out to basically double your daily revenue. Did you guys keep on buying ads on that page? How often were you doing it? We did it a couple times, but it, it tended as Instagram became more popular and it, it became a little more watered down. So it wasn't as effective. So is this a strategy that you still use today? We still do some of that stuff. Yeah, most of the stuff we do now is Facebook. It's paid ads on Facebook and Instagram because now you can advertise on Instagram without paying pay people's pages. But we do that too. It, it, it all depends. It just needs to make sense. This was before you could buy ads through Facebook's ad manager? Correct. Got it. So is this strategy recommended for people starting today to start looking for profiles on Instagram to sponsor their posts? I would for sure. It's a good way to get in front of like-minded people. And if you find a good ambassador or influencer that you know really loves your brand, I, I would say that's a, a great place to start and get your, your name out there in front of people. For sure. So you look for the best type of profile to sponsor is one that's already a big fan of your products? Yeah, I mean, that, that definitely helps. Um, you can send people stuff for free and let them try it. You really want to make sure that they genuinely support you and like your product. A lot of things now are super transactional, which is kind of disappointing. A lot has changed in the last eight or nine years, I'll tell you that. When you say transaction, you mean that they're just looking to get paid or get a commission? Yeah, they're just, it's like a one-time deal where we like to build relationships with people, you know. So it, it's just, you, you just got to be careful. A lot of people, all they want is to take make as much money as they possibly can from you. They don't care if it's successful at all. So you, you want to make sure you line yourself with people that actually, you know, they, they care at least a little bit on the success of what they're doing for you. Right. Is there anything specific that you look for on a profile or any questions that you ask of someone before working with them in this fashion? Yeah, I mean, just communicating with them. You'll know. You'll know if, if they're genuine or if they're just out to take your money and run. I always explain to them that we're looking for long-term partnerships up front. And I would rather, I try to explain to people that long money is better than short money when it comes to that type of marketing and me personally and the people that I work with would rather make just I'm just throwing this number out there five hundred dollars a month to promote the product than two thousand dollars one time and it doesn't work if that makes sense so if you can find a, a happy medium that works for both people then the success of it is going to be much higher and it's going to the longevity is going to be better too are there any red flags that you look for these days when you look for a profile to work with? I mean, no, I use my gut a lot, but again, if they're, if they're not willing to work with you in some capacity and it's just this or that, like, you know, no, I want 10 grand or I'm not going to do anything. It, it may not be the right fit, but again, I, I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't know. So what does this actually look like? What does the photo itself look like? If you were to do this today and give advice for someone doing this today, what are some key elements of the photo or even video that they should include in the post? As organic as possible, if that makes sense. So in use, dependent on what the product is. I mean, we, our product is very visual. So we like people we work with to use the product and actually show like before and afters of the shoes and whatever they've cleaned. But it really depends on the product. Obviously, if you're selling hats or something, as long as the person's wearing your hat and, you know, making sure that they tag you with the photo, I mean, it, it just really depends on the product. 
How does the profile link back to the product if the if their viewers want it? Yeah, I mean, there's multiple ways. They could obviously just put a link in the their description or their uh, on their page or. I mean, you can do it multiple ways. They can just tag your page so people go to your page. It, it really just depends on what the influencer is comfortable with. What do you like the most? I would say tagging our page is probably good. Or if, if they're using a specific product to be product specific, they check out this the link below if you want to purchase this product. We've really moved into YouTube, though, because YouTube is... It, the, the lifespan of the YouTube video is so much longer than an Instagram post that we, we really are focusing most of our attention on YouTube now. What's the strategy there? Similar, same. Find people that are that res- would resonate with your brand and you, you know reach out to them. Um, we've got relationships that we've had for three or four years now that continuously use them to promote our products. They use our products when they're doing restorations or they're cleaning shoes or whatever the case may be. The content's probably different though on YouTube because it sounds like on Instagram, it probably looks more like a commercial or an ad, but on YouTube it has to be less salesy content. Does that sound right? Yeah, I mean, it's just a, yeah, it's a totally different beast. I mean, we have our own YouTube channel. I would recommend to anybody that's building a brand to start a YouTube channel. The, the challenge is you have to be consistent. So if you're not going to consistently put up videos or content, then it's not really worth the time and energy. So we have our own YouTube channel now. We, I think we have close to 90 million views in total since we started. And that, that has really been a game changer for us too, I think. Okay, so you recommend brands starting a YouTube channel. What was your strategy? Like, how did you build up to 90 million views? What's your content strategy? So we started by doing regular cleaning videos. So how-to videos, how to clean certain shoes. There's so many different types of shoes and materials and styles and brands that there wasn't really any place to go to learn how to clean a specific shoe. So that's really where we started doing that pretty consistently. And then we brought in a guy named Vic Almighty, who is a restorer and customize customizer for shoes. So he'll take an old pair of Jordans off eBay and he'll completely refurbish them so they look like they're brand new. And people really get a kick out of watching that. So he'll use our products to clean them and then he'll, you know, he'll repaint them in sole or whatever. So we still do, we do one of those videos every Monday, restorations or a custom, and then we do a cleaning tutorial every Thursday. And we're trying to add additional content this year. It's just, you know, it's a lot of work. So you got to dedicate a whole team to it if you're going to keep pumping out content like that. And when you say consistency, you mean like you've got to release on a consistent schedule every week? Yes. It's it's ideal to be able to release stuff the same day at the same time because then people know when to tune in. So if it's more sporadic, you, you, you may not get the views, from, at least from our experience. Right. So that makes sense from your own YouTube channel, creating your own content. How does this work or how does it integrate with your marketing when you're working with other channels? It's similar. So, you you know, it, everybody's different. So every, every influencer or ambassador we work with is a little bit different in the way that they want to promote. Some do, you know, a slight mention in, you know, this video was sponsored by Rejuvenator. Some people will actually clean the, video, clean the shoes and do a comparison before and after. One of our longest partners is a guy named Tony D2 Wild, and he, he basically did a skit where he dressed up as a doctor and threw shoes in the mud and then came back and cleaned them. And it's his most successful video to date with, I think he's got, I haven't looked in a while, but it's probably close to 2 million views on that, that video. So it really depends on the the person um, and what they want to do. So this is the type of content that people are searching for, like people restoring shoes. Oh yeah. So there's search behind it. Yeah. I mean, YouTube is so big. The first time I realized that how big it was, we were at a sneaker show and these kids wait in line to get in the show for three or four hours, right? And the, the doors open at noon. They ran from waiting in line for four hours to wait in line to see a YouTuber. I had never seen, you know, I'm a little older and YouTube 
just is relatively new, but kids don't even watch TV these days, so they all watch YouTube. So that's when it really hit me like, damn, YouTube is powerful. I mean, people are getting famous on YouTube. It's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, definitely. It's crazy that there's this ability for anyone to kind of blow up out of nowhere if you're able to reach out to people. So when you do these videos yourself or when you're working with sponsoring other channels' content, is a goal to drive them to the Rejuvenator homepage or a specific product page or what seems to work best for you guys? I mean, it's brand awareness. I mean, it's all the above. So obviously, the more eyeballs that see it, the better. So it, it really, it's, it's all the above. We want to drive sales and we want brand awareness. It, it really just depends on if we're doing a specific targeted campaign or having a sale or, or whatever. But it's really just being consistent. For instance, if, if we're feeding people ads on Facebook and then they see it on YouTube, there's a better chance that they'll say, hey, you know what, let me check that out. So we're just trying to, you know, get eyeballs on the product. Got it. So speaking of Facebook, what's the strategy there? What's the focus on Facebook? Similar. Facebook's nice because you can strategically target certain demographics. I know they're getting a lot of flack lately, but for a business, it can be it can be life-changing because you have access to a huge, huge audience. So... We basically tailor our content to, to be interesting for sneaker enthusiasts, basically. And are videos or images working better for you guys in terms of driving traffic back to the site? It depends. Videos tend to have be work longer. Their longevity is better, but images work as well. What kind of content are you trying to put out through the video or images? You mentioned that you want to cater towards the audience, so these aren't like product shots probably, right? These are content pieces that could be interesting on their own? Yeah, I mean, we we tend to take, we kind of cheat a little. So we tend to take our Thursday cleaning videos and maybe some of the Monday videos and cut them down. So we kind of are able to use that content again. So we repurpose it in a sense. I don't know if that's necessarily the best way to do it, I think it certainly gets more mileage out of the content you're creating, and I'm assuming you have to really edit them down, right? Because it is on Facebook. People might not be watching as long as on YouTube. How do you know what to keep? And actually, how, how long are the videos that you're going to put up on Facebook? We tend to do 10 to 15 seconds. Um, it used to be 30, but we've brought it down to 15 or 30 seconds. We've taken it down to about 15 So these are 10 to 15 second videos on Facebook. How long are they coming from YouTube? It depends. I mean, about 10 minutes, five to, you know, we, we've done them five to 20 minutes before. It just, it all depends. Wow. So that's pretty big. You cut out a ton of stuff, right? So how do you know what to include in the 10 to 15 seconds? The most important parts. So you just want to get a little bit of each section, depending on what you're doing. So, you know, obviously if we're using a specific product, you want to show pieces of that. And then the most important is the before and after, after you've actually cleaned one shoe for us anyway so we'll clean one shoe and we'll leave one shoe dirty got it so you said to me that you should have a vision even if it's not totally clear can you say a little bit more about this like what does it mean to have a vision even if it's not totally clear so you i think without some type of vision of where it's going it's not even possible to get anywhere so my original vision has changed slightly now that we've gone on but i i've always seen i've always at least been able to see in my mind the future of where things are going and you know as time goes on things change slightly but I think being able to really picture where you want it to be and where you want to go is crucial. Got it. So you said to me that you should have a vision, even if it's not totally clear. Can you say a little bit more about this? Like, what does it mean to have a vision, even if it's not totally clear? Yeah, I think one of the benefits of being a smaller startup company, I mean, you guys are beyond the stage at this point, but when you were first starting out, it's that flexibility and agility to be adaptable. But you also kind of need to have, like you're saying, you have to have vision that you're focused on. But how do you know which parts of your vision you should allow to change versus the ones where you're like steadfast, you're not going to budge from this aspect of the vision? You, you're careful, I guess. I mean, I, I've made some mistakes. Really being careful with money is where I would, you know, if your vision doesn't align with common sense or smart spending, then you may need to change some things. 
Yeah, you said this before too about how you have to be realistic with your goals and don't be afraid to take shots. Just be careful about how you spend your money. So just hearing it, it sounds like you learned some tough lessons here. Can you say a little bit more about those? Yeah, I mean, I'm, as I mentioned, I've been pretty careful, but we've made some, or I, I shouldn't say we, but I have made some decisions that they haven't put us in a bad position necessarily, but they, I, I would have done it differently. Um, one is like, display um, for product our business is 90 percent online and we've been wanting to entertain getting into the retail market a little bit more and i made a pretty big purchase for product displays that i mean i made the, the buy probably two and a half years ago and we still have them i mean we've, we're using them but not like i thought we were gonna so i, don't, I didn't quite think that one out correctly is this an example of a goal that might have been too much of a stretch? Or what are some examples of goals that you might have come up with and then take a step back from and say, you know what, let's be more practical, let's be more realistic? Um, I mean, I'm normally pretty realistic, I would say. I've pretty much hit most of the goals that we've set. I, maybe I need to set them <laughs> to bigger goals. Why is that important? Why is it important to have realistic goals in your mind? Well, so you don't get discouraged, I guess, because there's reality and then there's goals that just aren't realistic at all. If you expect or set goals or you have these visions that just may not be possible, it might discourage you. It's baby steps. How do you balance them between the kind of larger vision that may take years to realize versus realistic goals? How do you keep that in your mind both at the same time? Well, we've recently introduced an OKR system, goal setting system. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but Google used it. There's a bunch of big companies that have used it and it, it kind of helps with that aspect, I guess, because you set, you set a really large goal and then you set key results or key metrics that you can chip away at to get to that goal. So it, it keeps things in line, I guess. And what it allows you to do is keep your eye on the big prize, but also focus on the small things that it's going to take to get there. Got it. So I want to talk a little more about how you run the company. How large is the team today? We, I think there's 13 of us in the building now. We have a guy, a couple guys in the UK. So um, there's close to 15 employees right now. We're looking to hire a couple more. So if there's any good uh, people out there, let me know. What do you like to do with your days? How do you like to focus your days on the business? It depends. We just we just bought a new building, so we're in the process of kind of building out our corporate headquarters. We're opening the store, um, so a lot of time and energy is going into that. We're trying to hire, you know, a couple more people soon in the next couple months. That's also a challenge too. So finding good people can be challenging. Right. What about the website? What kind of tools or apps uh, are you using to help run the website, e-commerce side of things? Yeah, obviously Shopify is our website of choice. We we actually used when I first started we used WordPress, but it wasn't it didn't have the functionality that I was looking for, so we luckily switched to Shopify. And there we you know, as as Shopify has grown, they've actually taken a lot of the apps, the previous apps out of the equation and it's just built into the, the programming and system now, which is nice. But there's apps like Judge.me for reviews that we use. There's Advanced Shipping Manager that allows us to really fine-tune our shipping and not offer certain products internationally that can't ship and stuff like that. So, you know, that, that's those are the two that ring a bell. I don't really handle that stuff anymore, so. Right. What about the website? What kind of tools or apps uh, are you using to help run the website, e-commerce side of things? That's an interesting question. I mean, making the checkout process as smooth and easy as possible. Um, our conversion rate is actually really well. And I don't know if that's just because of over time or we're driving more qualified or quality people to our site. But I know that a couple of years ago, we were at just below a 2.0 conversion rate. Now we're hovering at 3.5 and we're staying there, which is pretty good from from what I know about uh, online websites. That's awesome. Thanks so much for your time, Steve. So rejuvenator.com, R-E-S-H-O-E-V-N-8-R.com. Where do you want to focus your time over the next year? Like, where do you want to see the business go? Well, we're going to open a store. We're going to open a, a 
the sneaker store, drop up cleaning service, and then just continue to develop the team and add some more people and keep it going. Awesome. Again, thank you so much for your time, Steve. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Shopify Masters, the e-commerce podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs powered by Shopify. To get your exclusive 30-day extended trial, visit shopify.com slash masters.